Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting ready to get started up here. Okay, our very first question panel is, does the rod have access for kayaks and paddle boards? Yes, I wish I would have addressed that. And the proof of concept plan, um, what you did not see is the way they would be designed is you would have gaps of like 12 to 9 meters between each array. So just, just imagine a set like this, and then you have 12 to 9 meters in between, such that you could wade or get a kayak or what have you as you move through. That would be allowable. Yes. Thank you. There is a long word here and he told me to just say brown tide when I get to it. <laughs> What's the solution to mitigating legacy loads beyond muck? The load that has been released by the millions of pounds of seagrass dying, now dissolved in the water and sometimes sequestered by the brown tide, brown tide <laughs> and drift algae blooms. Why isn't this load being quantified? Well, it's really hard to quantify a moving target. So imagine the system as a stable, healthy system. We had seagrasses. Many of you remember. We would have drift algae, but there wasn't that much of it. And since 2011, uh, what the scientists believe is that, you know, we had enough nutrients. It's almost like, you know, fertilizing your lawn. Drift algae was expanding at the same time seagrass was expanding. And then 09, 010, 011, you know, kind of walking up to that big algal bloom, the super bloom in 2011, we had a collapse of that drift algal system, pushing those nutrients back into the water column and then fueling these micronutrients, these tiny little microscopic organisms, which we hadn't seen before. So the, the name of this brown tide is Oreo Umbra, and it's a scary player. So in Laguna Madre in Texas, it bloomed nonstop for almost a decade, totally destroyed the fisheries, totally destroyed the seagrasses because it's so brown, you can't, can't get sunlight to seagrasses. And we're in that cycle right now. Frank Catino, Captain Frank's here, and Captain Billy Rodney, and those two keep me involved on what's happening. So the system's flashy. So right now we have really good water quality in some places, and we're starting to see algal blooms again. Get ready. I mean, it's just starting to rain. We're in the heat of the summer. You know, we have almost had nonstop brown tide blooms in Banana River literally for the last three years. The system, you can't break it unless you get the nutrients reduced. It's the only way. And just like it was said earlier, it's and. So it's muck dredging, and it's stormwater reduction, and it's wastewater and septic. We have to get every pound of nitrogen and phosphorus we can, everywhere we can, and as we get that baseline down, you will see these blooms less extensive, you know, slower duration, uh, but we're going to need to be patient and just keep hammering at it. Sir, could you introduce yourself, by the way? Uh, yes, I'm Dwayne DeFries. I'm the Executive Director of the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. Miss Virginia's going to address that too. Oreo Ombra? Oreo Ombra. I think he put that card in so he could say the word. <laughs> I think of Oreo cookies. Oreo Ombra Lagunensis. Yes. yes. Uh, it has a second and last name. Um, we, we have work, and like I said, the, the team of researchers at Florida Institute of Technology has been out there measuring the amount of nutrients uh, coming out of the muck. And uh, like Dwayne said, it's not constant. It changes with temperature, it changes with pH, it changes with dissolved oxygen. So there, there are lots of factors that influence how much, uh, how fast that muck is decaying, is rotting uh, on any given day uh, or different hours of the day. And so it's uh, a highly variable target. Um, but we've collected a lot of data now. We have a much better understanding, um, and, and we can uh, correlate it to uh, different different temperatures and variables. But you guys know the basics of it. How long are you going to collect data? When are you going to start doing something? Like the whole time we, we're Okay. We have already completed the Turkey Creek okay. dredging project. We've already completed the MIMS dredging project. We've uh, just awarded the contract for the Grand Canal bidding project. We have 
Uh, the Sykes Creek project is about to go to bid. We have several projects in design right now along the Titusville Causeway and the NASA Causeway. So those projects are, are coming in the next couple years. We are, we are working uh, with those homeowners to help them get those permits. It's not the county that's holding up those permits, it's the state and we are working with those agencies to try to get those permits faster. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Dr. Lisa Soto. I'm the Executive Director of the Marine Resources Council, and we are one of the um, organizations working lagoon-wide in all five counties um, to protect and restore Indian River Lagoon. So MRC, you know, we've been here since the 80s. We started at Florida Tech. We became a, a nonprofit in 1991. Um, but we are working, I see the next question is about sharing information across counties. And we are one of the organizations that goes to multiple counties and has conversations with, you know, um, the leaders in those counties, with the communities in those counties. I was just down in Indy River County last week uh, talking to the, um, uh, the Audubon Society down there about how can we better work together to share the information on who's doing what. Because they're doing some amazing things in Indy River County that we don't know about. They're doing, you know, they've got a whole different set of problems down in St. Lucie County uh, that they're working on that we can benefit from knowing. And of course, everybody can benefit from the hard work that Brevard County is doing here. So we are one of the organizations that's helping to share uh, and get that, those uh, communications across county lines. Thank you, doctor. Okay, guys, do we have enough money? and the Soil Trust Fund to restore the Indian River Lagoon? The answer is no. <laughs> but it's an incredibly good start. You know, I get to work with 28 estuaries nationwide, and I can tell you that they're looking at Brevard County as a model. You know, to have 40 million a year over the next 10 is, is as big a countywide project as we see in America. Uh, but we are looking at a multi-billion dollar project if you look at all five counties. You know, I understand the frustration. I've been here 40 years. I don't like what I see, but I have seen in other places like Narragansett Bay, Puget Sound, <laughs> Chesapeake Bay, that if we keep doing these projects, we will see improvement. So the key is to stay the course. We keep putting that money in the ground on these projects, we will see water quality improvement, and we are going to need to be looking to state and federal dollars uh, as we move forward in order to leverage those county dollars with other other sources of funds. Okay, team. Are there examples of failed estuaries that have recovered, and should we have hope? I didn't answer that, so here's the story from those three that I talked about. Every single success story, it, number one, it took time, took public will, took investment, but every single one of those success stories focused on nitrogen and phosphorus removal and reduction. And they did it not like in one area, but they were all really broad, long-term efforts. So look at Tampa Bay. It took Tampa Bay 30 years. Tampa Bay was guacamole green when I moved here in 1978. Tampa Bay today has seagrasses that are at their 1943 levels. And water quality, with the exception of old Tampa Bay, is having some of their own problems. It looks really good. Sarasota Bay's had improvements and they've kind of lost, you know, some areas because of, you know, just aging infrastructure. So the answer is not only should you have hope, if we go quicker, move more projects faster, we'll see recovery faster. There's a cost value here that we learned with Everglades restoration. Ten years ago, Everglades restoration was estimated at 10 billion. A decade later, it's 17 billion. So just like any investment, you want to get your money in the ground as fast as you can so we can get out in front of this. Good answer. I'd also like to uh, mention that one of the products that Marine Resources Council recently produces the state is the Indian Revolution Health Update. This report is over there available on our table. The reason we did this is to provide that hope, to show that, oh, you can see these colors in this graph. I know it's hard to see from there, uh, that they go from red to green to red to orange. What we want to see is things go from red to orange to yellow to green. We want to see that happen. We're going to do this every year to show that that's happening because it's going to take a long time and we want to see it happen over time. So we have to be in it in the law for the long game 
You know, this is going to be a marathon. It's not a sprint. We're in it for the long run, and we're going to be tracking it over time. We're seeing nitrogen going down. We're seeing phosphorus going down. We're seeing our seagrass coming back. That's what this report is all about. Uh, we're adding the tributaries, meaning the rivers and major uh, uh, canals that are coming into the lagoon. We're adding them this year, so we'll be able to see, you know, where is this pollution coming from? Is it coming down the rivers? Which rivers are the most problematic? Where are the gaps in monitoring? Somebody questioned the need for data. We need data badly. What we found is in 20 years, we've lost monitoring. We're not monitoring as much as we used to. We're not monitoring for bacteria as much as we used to, which is something people are worried about. Being if you're out in the lagoon kayaking and windsurfing, you want to know if there's bacteria in the water. So that's one of the things we're hoping to add um, and you know, continue to guide our agencies in where they should be directing these dollars for monitoring so that has the, it, it's, it's providing the, the information that we need. Thank you, ma'am. What is the COC? Does it have staff and consultants, and what do they do? All right. The COC is the Citizens Oversight Committee, and yeah, we have several in the room. So, uh, Dr. John Windsor and uh, Lorraine Koss and Courtney Barker and Mel uh, Martin and David Lane. Is there Terry Casto, um, Charlie Benuto, Laura Lee Thompson? <laughs> Stand up, yeah. You're on the Citizens Oversight Committee. There are, there are 14 of them. Um, they, they meet monthly. They, uh, they, the only staff they have is, is uh, the natural resources, the county's natural resources staff. Um, and uh, so they review the, the plan, the Save Our Indian River Lagoon plan, uh, the financial statements, um, the progress reports on all those projects. What was the rest of the question? What do they do? Um, they, they review a lot of information and they provide recommendations that staff carries to the county commission. Um, the county commission has the ultimate authority on how the dollars are, are, are allocated, the half cent sales tax, how it's allocated and um, uh, revisions to the, the Save Our Indian River Lagoon project plan. Okay, what is happening at the state government level to support the effort of the cleanup of the lagoon and at the national level? Let's start with the state. There's a lot going on. Uh, we had a number of bills that were policy bills at the state level. And I guess the unfortunate news is many of those policy bills didn't quite make it to the governor's desk. However, we've got seen record funding uh, in fact, historic funding for water in the state of Florida. You know, our new governor DeSantis has just appointed a scientist to work directly with the governor's office. I spent two hours with him in Tallahassee on Friday. For the first time in my 40 years in Florida, water isn't a secondary issue in Tallahassee. It is the issue. And so record funding for Everglades, record funding for Red Tide, we would have liked to have seen a little bit more funding for Indian River Lagoon, but the funding was still really good. There's a lot of good projects, and we'll know in the next couple of weeks, because the governor still has a, a veto power on some of those projects. So I think we are moving in the right direction. And the key for all of you who advise your elected officials uh, in Tallahassee is we need stable, recurring funding for local cost share. So we need to know every single year that we can use the Brevard County dollars and match them with state dollars. That recurring funding hasn't happened to this point, but it was a big issue this year. The federal level, if you asked me six months ago, eight months ago, I'd say, gosh, we're really going to struggle. Um, because I represent the National Estuary Program, we've had level funding, uh, which is very quite, you know, it's modest, 600000 a year for the 28 estuaries that Congress has d dedicated as estuaries of national significance, it's not a lot of money. And for the first time in decade, uh, we will see, if everything goes right, a modest increase in our base funding for each of the national estuary programs. 
We have also seen, thanks to our elected officials, especially Bill Posey here in Brevard County, put local cost share competitive grant money uh, back in 2016. Those dollars are going to get released sometime this year uh, by EPA. But the really big news doesn't affect us in the northern end of the lagoon, but in the southern end is it looks like the president is going to support both the House and the Senate at $200 million for Everglades restoration. And we have been asking for that year after year. The feds haven't delivered. And for the first time, it looks like we're heading to that $200 million uh, figure, which is a major change. So I am guardedly optimistic, but if you as citizens need to be pushing at Tallahassee and Washington and constantly letting our elected officials know that clean water is the lifeblood of Florida's economy and our quality of life. It can't be a secondary issue. It has to be a primary issue. And every year we have to work for those dollars. Thank you, sir. What are we doing as a county to keep the sewer plants from overflowing during hurricanes? Nobody does. <laughs> Um, so, uh, the, right, there are 16 or 17 wastewater treatment plants in the county, depending on whether you, you count the federal one um, at the, the Space Center. And some of them are operated by the county, and some of them are operated by the individual municipalities. Um, right, Titusville has two. Um, and so, you know, each of those entities is responsible for maintaining their systems. Um, and there's a lot of work going on, smoke testing those systems, uh, running cameras through those systems to find leaks. The problem with leaks is that during a storm, storm water leaks into the pipes. The plants are designed for a certain capacity, and all of a sudden there's the, all this additional storm water in the system that exceeds the capacity of the wastewater treatment plant uh, to process or of the conveyance system to carry it to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so I, I think you know all of those entities are assessing uh, where are the weaknesses, where are the flaws in their utility systems, and um, prioritizing those repairs. Uh, I know the county has shifted uh, over $10 million around trying to address the, the worst leaks uh, as fast as possible. And, um, and then as, as Eddie presented, we have $8 million going to the, the Titusville facility to upgrade that. Uh, we're working with Cocoa Beach on upgrades to their facility, um, on Palm Bay to upgrades to theirs, Melbourne. Um, and so there, there are a lot of projects underway to improve those wastewater treatment uh, utilities. Can I, can I add a little something? I just wanted to add that, you know, we talk about lateral lines, and the lateral line is the line that goes between your house and the street. And the, as a homeowner, that's our responsibility. I live in an older home in downtown Melbourne, and I know I'm going to have to deal with my lateral line at some point. There are cities who are, are, are able to offer grants to assist homeowners with that. I mean, that's, that's our problem, and that is a, a weakness in the link that it just takes one, one weak link to break the chain, right? If my line is leaking, then when a, when a storm comes, like, like Fay, and we had 22 inches of rain, the, the groundwater comes up, it's going to go right into my lateral by the buckets down the storm line into the wastewater treatment facility and back it up. So they have to release that water or it's going to back up to everybody's bathtub, really, is probably where it's going to come out. But that's a bad situation. So the city has no choice to do that. They have to release it. And I love the lagoon. So to see that happen breaks my heart. But I know the alternative is people, people's health and safety is going to be at risk. So it is, it's a problem. It's 50 years in the making that, you know, it's prioritizing. We don't have enough money. We don't have the billions, if not tens of billions of dollars to just fix all those lines. So it's about prioritizing where those areas are that the laterals and the main infrastructure is probably leaking and deal with them one at a time. But if we're not dealing with ours as homeowners on our property, there's still going to be those missing links. There's still going to be those leaking pipes. So that's a you know that's another issue. It's a financial one. We got to start planning for it 
So it's part of my maintenance. That's why I'm like, I know I'm going to have to deal with it just like I got to deal with my roof. It's one of those, t you know, hopefully not tens of thousands, but I have terrazzo and I don't want to lose that. <laughs> um, you know, it's one of those things you got to plan for as, as uh, you know, think about with your home maintenance. Okay, how much are biosolids contributing to the pollution in the IRL and the St. John's? We don't believe it's monitored by the state for over 13 years, and the smell says that we think that sewage is in it. Biosolids are a problem. You heard, uh, you know, presentations about the reclaim water. So biosolids are interesting. We have different levels of biosolids. And it's true, we have not monitored and, and managed biosolids well in the state of Florida. The state of Florida is addressing that issue. Uh, we have more than a few really bad examples where lakes have actually been turned from near pristine to full algal bloom, you know, just based on the land use practices on, on those lands around the lake. And just like everything else, it's not just biosolids. The key to you know, solving the biosolids problem is really at the wastewater treatment plant, trying to get higher level, higher standards in nutrient reduction, and then trying to manage what you do with biosolids. So we were really lucky, Virginia and I and others have been you know, looking at what does that next generation wastewater treatment plant look like? And it's out there right now. So there are plants out there that will take biosolids turn it right into energy to fuel the plant, where you have none of that human waste going to ground. Uh, but there are ways to manage it, and we need to manage it better. We have not done a good job in the state of Florida with biosolids or reclaim water management. And so as a result, you can get the nutrients, but we also know that we've got pharmaceuticals and other compounds coming through the human waste stream that are already effect, affecting wildlife. So we have Atlantic bottlenose dolphin in the Indian River Lagoon that are already resistant to human antibiotics. Trust me, they're not getting them at Publix or getting them at the pharmacy. You know, they're picking that up through the water. All of that comes through our current wastewater uh, technology. So we've got that next gen opportunity when we can't you know go to an old plant and upgrade them easily but when you need to do a new plant we should be going to the state of the art and technology so that waste is combusted handled well and we don't put it back into the water or the ground thank you sir okay guys why does the river smell by McDonald's <laughs> <laughs> and what can be done about it <laughs> Well, I'm glad I had a chance to talk tonight, but um, <laughs> well, what you've got right there on the north side of, of McDonald's is a little nook, kind of like, a, it looks like an armpit going with smells, um, where there's shallower, um, the, the sand is built up there, and so you're getting a lot of the, uh, the algae and the, and the vegetative material that's coming up and drying there, and so it's just providing uh, a breeding ground right there, and the wind, of course, blows it straight across uh, the McDonald's parking lot, so yeah, you will smell it out there. Um, I've heard that it's, it's been, people have noticed it being worse than in, in other years. Um, I don't know why that would be, um, but again, it's, it's the strong winds and the, the drying out of the material right there. Um, and, and you know, the, I, how many of you have been on the water the last three or four months? I know a few of the guides, you notice how clear it's been? So that drift algae is actually like a sponge. It is taking those nutrients up. So it, coming out of the winter when the water's cold, drift algae starts to grow like crazy. Uh, the problem is that now we're coming into the summer. We had really strong west winds. So I'm getting phone calls from India Atlantic, South Beaches. It's piling up on the western shoreline of the South Beaches right now. And I, I know exactly where McDonald's is and it piles up in that little nook and as soon as it starts to break down in this really hot weather you know you're going to start smelling that decomposition uh, but it's also going to fuel the next microalgal bloom so all the nutrients that are in that macroalgae get pushed right back into the water column and and you get this vicious cycle you know between you know different kinds of vegetation and again, it's you got to reduce the nutrients to get that that level down. Billy, just a quick comment on that. Does the county have any kind of plan that like we were planning to remove? If there was another fish kill to remove all the fish. Is there any plan to possibly try to remove some of that algae since it's sequestered so much nutrients? 
So the question uh, from Cat Billy Rotney is, you know, is there a plan to re remove that algae? You can legally, if you're on a shoreline, you're allowed to that algae that's on your beach or behind your HOA, you can harvest it. To be perfectly honest, you know, if you went a little bit in the water, you probably nobody's going to say anything. But right now, you cannot go into the water, pull that out of the water column without a permit. Uh, both Virginia and I have had a conversation with DEP uh, because it does make sense that if you could harvest that out before it breaks down, that you know we would be removing nutrients. We're not quite there yet, but the one woman who was frustrated about permits, we're all frustrated about challenges with permits, and we're doing our best at federal and state levels to try to you know get things faster, easier, but you know. If it's on your shoreline, the best thing you can do is rake it up, you know, and get rid of it. It's just the bacteria. So here's the good news about that. It, as far as we know, there's no toxicity. You know, it's not like what we saw down in South Florida with the, you know, the bloom coming out of Lake O, but it is a eye, throat, and lung irritant. If you happen to have COPD or any kind of respiratory challenges, if you're an asthmatic, I'm hypersensitive to that stuff because they actually worked in it for 20 years as a researcher and it really bothers me but it you know as far as we know there's no immediate or long-lasting effects but it is something you shouldn't you know if your eyes are watering if your body's telling you get out of there uh, but the question was you know there's a lot of it and we're out of balance we have more drift algae you know, than we've ever seen in the system. And it's the system trying to absorb those nutrients. And uh, until we get those nutrients down, we won't see that balance. And it's a vicious cycle between the drift algae and there's multiple species. One you're probably seeing is kind of brown and red, and then it'll start getting really white and milky as that's it decays. Right and Very all it's doing is taking that nitrogen that's kind of caught in a sponge and throwing it right back into the water column. Uh, but the other thing that's really problematic right now, it's summertime. This is when seagrasses normally will be growing in those shallows. Mm -hmm. And part of what you're sensitized to is that when it breaks down, you'll see hydrogen sulfide and you'll smell it. it smells like sulfur. So the pH drops and seagrasses simply can't live in that, but also fish and other organisms will die in it because of a lack of oxygen. And so that vicious cycle is hard to break, but good for you for taking the time. I know it seems like a, an impossibility to rake, but every cubic meter you take, you're taking nitrogen and phosphorus out of the system. And so we appreciate you doing that hard work because it's no fun. Okay, why does permitting take so long for the projected projects? <laughs> it's been a problem for 150 years. We won't solve it today. <laughs> um, so, some of why the permitting takes so long is there's a lot of data that has to be collected to demonstrate that you're not doing harm, that you're designing the project in such a way that you're avoiding harm to other resources that are supposed to be protected. Um, with, with dredging, obviously they don't want you dredging if their seagrass is there. So you've got to do uh, surveys of seagrass and you've got to do those surveys during the seagrass growing season, not uh, when the, you know, the time of year when seagrass isn't um, as spread out as, as it gets. And, and so, you know, there's the, the timing of the, the data collection with the, your question about, you know, can we harvest or, or Billy's question about harvesting the algae, that uh, grassal area, those clumps of floating macroalgae provide habitat for all kinds of, you know, shrimp and crustaceans and uh, small fish. And so the agencies have concerns about removing that habitat. So the seagrass is not there providing habitat. The macroalgae is the next best thing. And so how do you how do you harvest that without taking out the very critters that we're trying to provide habitat for? So um, the, the agencies are not used 
two permitting restoration projects, they are used to development review. And so we keep coming to them with uh, requests to do things that they, they're not trained in how to respond. They don't know how to review it and they got to go up their chain and they give us an answer that we don't like and then we make a whole bunch of phone calls and we demand meetings and we drive to Orlando Central District and we go to Tallahassee and um, so it's just a it's a miserable long drawn out process uh, we've been working with uh, Congressman Posey's office trying to streamline permitting uh, and that has worked with some of the federal review agencies uh, it's worked with some of them better than others and uh, you know we'll we'll continue to to try to to make inroads I part of what the um, the oyster work you know, they were concerned that uh, if oysters were had been if so many oysters had been lost from the lagoon then why did we think putting new oysters back was going to work and we said, well, you know, in truth, we don't know. That's why we need to test it and find out, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna work with the zoo. We're gonna train all these oyster gardeners. Uh, they're gonna have, you know, several hundred oysters under their docks at over a thousand different sites up and down the whole lagoon. And we'll find out where will oysters grow? Where won't oysters grow? And, and so we have to do that data collection to demonstrate to the agencies that we're not just harvesting a few oysters from the lagoon, using them to create the larvae, to grow little oysters, to give to the gardeners, and then throwing oysters back into the lagoon to their death. Right? We, ha we have to demonstrate that they're going to succeed, that there's a net benefit, that they're going to be uh, filtering the water and making improvements. And, and the agencies you know, don't know the answer. So they make us provide the data for them to be able to check the boxes that they're doing a good thing for the environment and not doing harm. Um, so any, anytime you want to do something new and different, it is slow going with regulatory agencies. If septic tanks are bad, what are the grants or efforts to subsidize residential conversions on the barrier islands? And why don't we just get rid of all the septic systems? So to get rid of all the septic systems in Brevard, I've estimated would take uh, two and a half to three billion dollars. Also, we don't have sufficient capacity at the wastewater treatment plant, so we would need to build um, multiple additional wastewater treatment plants at you know 50 million apiece. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've, we've had to prioritize, and that's why I talked about, uh, we have looked at the, the uh, location of every single septic tank in terms of the soil conditions, the depth to groundwater, and the distance to open water. We've prioritized those, and we do have funding to hook those most important clusters of septic up to sewer. Um, there are also lots that are adjacent to force mains that wouldn't normally hook up. You have to have a special uh, grinder pump and pump to be able to push your sewage into a forced um, main. Um, so we have grants to help people do that. And we also, for septic systems that are uh, a high priority in terms of pollutant load to the lagoon, but they are not in a cluster, they're not near a wastewater treatment plant, or the nearest wastewater treatment plant is already full and doesn't have the capacity to take more sewer, uh, more, more septic. Then we have funds to upgrade those septic systems from the basic <coughs> conventional septic to a nutrient removing septic system. And there are multiple different kinds of septic systems out there that do a better job at handling human waste and reducing the, the nutrient load. And so there, there are grant programs and you can contact our office uh, for information to find out whether you're in one of those, whether you have one of those. And we are uh, currently working on mailing lists uh, to be able to notify people if they are um, eligible for one of those programs. And I, the other part of that question, I, I, I think, is the new development septic systems, whether, you know, a, a city or 
uh, jurisdiction wants to pass a moratorium on any new septic tanks. There are places like the Keys that have done that. And, you know, it just, it starts to become a hindrance for development. But the good thing is your property values go up when that happens. <laughs> so those of you who want to increase your property values, just encourage your, your leaders to pass a moratorium on the septic because there'll be no development. Development will stop. So that becomes a problem for uh, the growth of a community. You know, it kind of depends on how you want to grow as a community. You need to have that meaningful conversation. Uh, but new septic, I mean, the county passed an ordinance recently where they designated an area where if you were going to build a new building, you had to put in advanced treatment septic. So that's kind of a, a halfway. You know that there's a certain area where we suspect the septic tanks will have the biggest impact on the lagoon. Uh, you need to use advanced treatment septic systems in these new developments here. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Do you support a pilot project to increase flushing out of the lagoon? The answer on that is yes, we support a pilot project if there's sufficient scientific data to suggest that a pilot project is both warranted and safe. I've got a stack like that high of flushing projects. State legislature, um, at least at the moment, if it doesn't get vetoed, has 800000 in the budget uh, for some research at Florida Institute of Technology. Here's the caution, and I get accused of being the anti, you know, inlet, anti-flushing guy. I'm not anti at all. Um, after 40 years, I know that the mantra should be do no harm. And when I look at where we're thinking about this, which is in the Banana River, you got high nutrients, you're going to bring ocean water into a high nutrient system, you are no longer going to have the estuary that we once had. That is a big, big decision, because you will never see that estuary ever again in the same way. <coughs> Inlets are challenging. So if you look at all the body of, of need for an inlet, you know, while it does open and access to the ocean, you're going to have to have sand management, you're going to have to pass a taxing district, you're going to spend even on a small inlet like Sebastian Inlet at least two million a year just managing sand so you don't have erosion. And then if you get a Cat 4, Cat 5 hurricane, you're going to introduce storm surge on the mainland at a place that's never had it, like Rockledge or northern Melbourne. So inlets have a lot of trade-offs that are challenging. Pumping water, in my opinion, should be the last resort. And this is just my personal opinion as a scientist. We shouldn't take it off the table. We should do the work. We should understand how we make decisions. We are going to have a storm breach the Barrier Island. Could be this year, could be next year. It's just a matter of time. And then when that does happen, that kind of pilot study could advise the county commission and the state, what do you do next? We had, we've had breaches, by the way. We had one just briefly a number of years ago in Mosquito Lagoon. It immediately closed up. We had a massive breach up in the Matanzas system you know, a few years ago, uh, which immediately got filled by FEMA trucks, and that is still an unstable system. Uh, we've seen it in Texas. We saw it after Michael in the Panhandle. You want to make those decisions with the best science. So doing the preliminary research to understand salinity and balance, I'm 100% in support of the science, but this idea that somehow introducing an ocean water solves this problem, think of it like this. Doesn't remove a single pound of nitrogen, doesn't remove a single pound of phosphorus. It's going to move the muck around, and where is it going to move it? from one location to the next. And so, yes, I support, and in fact, the National Estuary Program in our comprehensive management plan says we need to do that work. We need to understand it better. It's not a silver bullet, and it's not restoration. You won't be taking the lagoon back to some, you know, healthy state. You will be changing it, and that is the kind of decision that we as a community and as a scientific community should not make lightly without due diligence and understanding all the risks, all the costs, and, all, and also the outcomes. What exactly are we managing to just by adding seawater? And so with something we may, if this funding happens, that project will start 
you know, as soon as the funding breaks through, and if it doesn't happen, if it does get vetoed, it's going to be back at the table again. So getting the best available science is the key, and then we can make decisions based on, you know, factual information and risk assessment. I moved here 40 years ago as a marine scientist because it was such a spectacular system with biodiversity that I saw nowhere else in the world, and we do not have that right now. But you know, just moving seawater in isn't going to get you to what you think you want. And, and so every project is going to get us closer, but it, there is no project we're going to do that's going to change this overnight. It took us 50 years to get here. I think we could see change, and actually we saw it in the last five months. So we had one of those systems this year where we had a little bit normal weather in the winter, a lot less rain, and we've had some spectacular water clarity. Seagrasses aren't coming back, and so we're going to have to replace seagrasses. But we are seeing <laughs> fishery change. You can ask the guide. Spotted sea trout and estuarine species, it's not the way it used to be. And, and nor do you see that lush, you know, biodiversity that Laura Lee grew up with that I moved here for. And so the key is that you put as much money into the ground as fast as you can on these projects to reduce nutrients, you will see change. There isn't any quick fix for this other than reduce, 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 and then dredge muck. If you look at the science we already have from Florida Tech, the biggest bang for the buck is getting that nutrient load that's already in the system out of the system. Dredging has improved O'Galley River, Sebastian River, Crane Creek, you know, but it's, it's not the only thing, but that bloom in 2011, all of the considerable science showed that that was internally driven. It wasn't rainfall, that was nutrients already in the system. And, and Virginia very, you know, adequately showed you how much of that muck is doing right now. So we've got to keep dredging. And we did not get, by the way, uh, funding for dredging in the state this year, which was really frustrating for those of us who know how important it is. Are you having any luck getting <coughs> fertilizer manufacturers on board to help us out by just simply cutting down on the supply of phosphorus and nitrogen? The, she was asking about fertilizer manufacturers mm -hmm. and whether they, they have been participating or assisting by developing fertilizers. I think your question is about developing fertilizers that would be consistent with the ordinances that were passed in Florida. Is that right? Well, I'm, I'm curious. Are they resisting attempts to lower? The low are they, are they resisting? So the, um, what we in, in, I want to say probably for 10 years we've been trying to pass different types of fertilizer laws in Florida. Um, there has been resistance, but we were successful in passing four major components of the fertilizer ordinance, which were described earlier. One is that you can't apply nitrogen to your lawn during the rainy season, which is now June 1 to September 30. The other is you can't apply phosphorus at all because phosphate is very rich in Florida. It's, in fact, we're a phosphate mining state. Most of the fertilizer uh, phosphorus uh, phosphate is is actually mined here in Florida, so we don't need to apply phosphorus. And then the the hard part about the ordinance is the 50% slow release. The, initially, the industry tried to figure out how do we do that. You can do with with pellet types of fertilizers. You can you can coat it almost like a slow release vitamin. So it's got a urea coating on it that slowly releases. And you can read your bag, and at the bottom it'll say, you know, how much of the pound like on the if the amount of nitrogen is 16 and 8 of that is slow release, you know you've got a 50% slow release. And then the last thing is a setback from a water body, and that ranges by city or county, how many feet it is away that you cannot apply fertilizer at all. There's a buffer zone between the water's edge, whether it's a canal or the lagoon. Uh, it could be 10, 15, 20 feet. It depends on the city. The, um, so the, until the market, until the fertilizer industry started to figure out how to create the slow release and to provide the products that were consistent with these ordinances, there was a lot of kickback. Now the market wants and I'm like, don't figure it out. You know, these guys are going to figure out how to make this a market for themselves. Uh, they're starting to do that now. Scott's came out with a, a, a brand that is consistent with our, our Florida ordinances. Um, the challenge, I think, has been the chemical fertilizers, the spray kind. Uh, some of the 
things they were adding to it to make it slow release were, were uh, other environmental hazards. So we were like, well, that's not a good idea to add uh, you know, turpentine to fertilizer to make it slow release. So, uh, so I think they're figuring it out. I saw the Chemlon truck today, and I almost wanted to like stop and go, can I test your fertilizer and see what's in that? Because we don't know. The only county in the state of Florida is Pinellas that's going around and getting a little jar and actually testing those Chemlon trucks to see if they're what they're applying. So we don't, we don't. I don't think we're enforcing, you know, the the liquid fertilizers. I know the last that I heard from the industry was that was their challenge was trying to figure out how to make a slow release liquid fertilizer. So if you have a, a professional fertilizing your lawn, ask them uh, what they're applying. If you don't see them, leave a note on your door and say, please leave me a list of what you're applying to my lawn. You have a right to know you're paying them. You know, when you take your car into the car to get it taken care of at, at the uh, maintenance place, you, don't you ask the maintenance guys what they did to your car. You need to, you know, you, you have a right to know what they're doing to your lawn, uh, and you know, you, you're paying them, you know, approve what they're going to apply when. Thank you for that question. <clears throat> But you know, you have the power. Don't buy it, don't apply it. So every homeowner can say, look, I'm gonna go a different route, you know, whether it's pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizer, you know, move to, you know, native vegetation, get away from sod, which is an extremely expensive thing to try to keep healthy. And you don't have to do it all at once, but you as a consumer, we as consumers, just stop buying it, stop applying it, and go to a different vegetation type, and uh, we will control that market. Okay, guys, listen on this one. It's a long one. It's even typed, so someone really took their time on it. It is widely reported that there has been a large increase in the saltwater catfish population since the gill net ban in 1995. I have done stomach content analysis on hundreds of these catfish, and I'm concerned that their consumption of both seagrass and juvenile fish of more desirable species is having a serious effect on the estuaries. No studies have been done on this matter since the ban. What can I do to get the ban ball rolling? I'm gonna help you get that ball rolling by talking to Florida Fish and Wildlife. You know, we do, um, fish surveys, but I don't know that they focused on catfish, but if you talk to anybody, whether it's commercial or recreational fishers on this lagoon, we have seen the fishery shift, and, and it's shifting based on the food chain. And so the fact that we may have more catfish is no big surprise. Um, I don't know about the catfish relationship to seagrasses, but doesn't that would not at all surprise me. It's an indicator of a you know, a system that's been destabilized. And here's the scary part, and, and a little bit of just factual information. Everywhere you read, you hear the Indian River Lagoon was the most biologically diverse estuary in North America. How many people have heard that? And the fact is, it's probably not true. You know, we were one of the few who actually looked at biological diversity back in 1995. So we we're one of the few who actually had data but I can tell you just from being out on the system, we are not as biologically diverse by a long stretch today than we were back in 78 and the 80s when we were in good shape. So I'm gonna follow up with FWC on this catfish issue, uh, but we are seeing shifting baselines, and, and here's the worry for us as scientists. The longer we take to get water quality right, the more these systems will shift to a not valuable species like a catfish and away from trout, away from red drum, away from snook, and it gets harder and more expensive to get the system turned the longer we are out of balance. So, so time is not in our favor. Uh, we've got to work on water quality as soon as we can. Thank you, sir. Okay, we have time for one more question. I've got one a little different. The other ones are kind of some things we discussed. So our last question is, would the wad stones work for controlling erosion caused on retention pond shorelines in homeowner association communities? Uh, yes, they would have a similar effect. You have the same issue in a stormwater pond as you can in an estuary or even a large lake area. So they have been used in that, in that environment. And if 
that's something that you're interested in, I'm sure you know you can investigate it more and vet it internally to see if it's an option. But it provides the same uh, wave dissipation and absorption rate. I just add that uh, the planting something with deeper roots uh, than sod might also help reduce the erosion along a, a stormwater pond. Okay, I want to thank our panelists for being up here tonight and you know they volunteered their time for this because they're so passionate. We're in a room full of a lot of smart people, so I just want to thank her for that. A, a little quick note, um, um, Mr. Connick's going to get up here in a second and talk to you, but um, Ace Hardware, just a little bit of information, and Titusville, they've actually pulled the bad fertilizer off their shelves until after we're through the rainy season. So. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, yeah, so... Um, uh, Bill Pasternak um, of uh, Titusville I, Ace um, has pulled virtually all the fertilizer off the shelves and will keep it off, as I understand it, uh, until September 30. Um, and I think we have Kevin uh, Dunmire and Gary Sanders. Are you both here? Go ahead and stand up. Let's recognize these. These are the two managers. And thank you. Thank you very much. This is leadership in your community. Um, so we've, we've thanked uh, uh, Virginia, uh, ba uh, Virginia Barker, uh, uh, Lisa Soto, Dwayne DeFries, uh, Eddie Galindo, uh, Chad Richard, uh, Commissioner uh, Pritchett, and give them another round. And Dwayne, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, absolutely, Dwayne DeFries. <laughs> who maybe deserves his own round of applause. <laughs> and, then, and then also our speakers, um, uh, MJ Waters, uh, Virginia once again, um, <clears throat> Eddie Galindo again, um, and um, uh, yeah, exactly, Laura Lee and, and Chad. So one more round of applause. I think Laura Lee will invite us to have another bite. <laughs> yeah, thanks again. And, and like I said, I, it, it means a whole lot that you guys took the time to come here and learn. And um, hopefully you'll go out and buy a whole bunch of native plants to put in your yard and stop mowing your grass and stop fertilizing it. Um, I don't even own a lawnmower. I just, I have a lot of really cool plants around my house and I have lots of birds and wildlife and butterflies and, you know, like little grandkids next door, they come over and they say, why do you have so many butterflies in your yard? My grandfather doesn't have any butterflies. Well, he mows his yard and he, and he doesn't have any, any plants. So anyway, that's probably the best thing you could do is, is go native in your yards. And um, there's food left, there's to-go boxes. Please help yourselves. And thank you very, very much for coming tonight. Thank you.